Um, well, I, I have been interested in indigenous cultures, especially in Mexico, and related to um, the main root of uh, Mexican culture, which is uh, Toltequity, from the antique Toltecs. Basically, I have been uh, for some 25 years relating to uh, Huicholes, Mazatecs, Nahuas and Maya people in the understanding of their culture. Uh, with the Huicholes, um, through a civil association, helping them to um, prevent uh, more damage to their culture because of um, the system invasions such as electricity, powder mill, vaccines uh, and so on. Um, so, from what I learned from these people uh, was a better way of living, easier, more profound, deeply connected to nature and uh, to the spirit, of course. So, um, uh, at a certain point I just had to share this with people, because it was so good for me, and I found it working for others. And eventually, because people kept on coming, looking for these tools, I uh, arranged them in a workshop kind of uh, frame to be able to give it in a certain order and uh, with a progression from let's say easy to more difficult which is just about comprehension of what you can do with yourself so that's basically what I'm into so um, generally what is happening in the world right now with uh, indigenous culture and indigenous knowledge and wisdom what's happening hmm. it's happening that unfortunately it seems that the system doesn't like indigenous groups to my understanding because they are not uh, economically productive and they do not pay taxes and they cannot be so easily controlled so there seems to be all over the planet like a, a plan to to sur surround them and slowly cut down their their freedoms and and there's this very obvious plan of invasion through, as I mentioned before, electricity and, and genetic uh, seeds and uh, um, medical treatment for uh, pregnancy and uh, <laughs> all these things that will eventually dissolve their cultures into the system. So within, I see it within from four to six generations probably they will be gone from the planet. So why is it important to preserve their wisdom and share their wisdom? What is it they've got that we don't have? Well, we, we have lost uh, connection to the spirit and to nature because of the way we've been um, taught that nature is just a source of uh, prime matter to build things and to be used without any respect for the life of the being that lives in a tree. It's just seen as a product to produce wood and paper and furniture and so on. So this got generalized in a way that we, we lost connection with nature and the respect to it. And of course, uh, through nature we had um, an important connection to the spirit of life. We are nature as well and we are alive and we have a spirit. So I think preserving um, indigenous knowledge is very important to rescue our relationship with, with life within ourselves as humans. To, important values of respect and helping each other and uh, just living a, a harmonic way on this beautiful planet. Um, so what else is happening in the world right now, not just to indigenous cultures but to, to nature? I mean, what is the system doing in the planet right now? Well, the system, as I said, is just using nature and uh, we have been so demanding that we have slowly uh, gotten to the point of running out of forests and clean water and mining is producing incredible uh, pollution where it's happening and uh, the genetic modified f foods are affecting our genetics and producing new illnesses and uh, all this comes with a very complex social problem of the amount of people that are needing everyday food and, and goods and money and, and work so I think nature is being pretty much damaged by our presence here. As we all know, this is not, not something new. And can this go on much longer? <laughs> well, I don't think it can go on much longer. We are already in a, in a very dangerous point. I think we are just about to run out of simple things like water. And when we run out of water, we're gonna see some 
nasty fights going on for it and serious wars and not to mention the rest about food and whatever else you know so I, I think we're in, in a important moment to make de decisions or to surrender to uh, annihilation. Okay. So what does 2012 mean to you? I mean, there's a state hanging around in the world in the public consciousness. A lot of people are talking about it and thinking about it. Well, what is 2012 to you? <laughs> For me, it's very interesting. I haven't really been able to fix myself in a position where I really believe that all humankind is going to awaken like a miracle from one night to the other. Uh, I also don't believe in, in uh, the destruction or the end of the world, like uh, there's a, a line that people like to be catastrophic about it. But I find that I'm very curious for, for this date because certainly people is um, fixing to it in one way or another. There are like two clear sides. One is thinking the end of the world and the other side is thinking about the awakening of humanity. What, what I have seen happen many times is that the consciousness of masses really affects what is going on on the planet. So I'm curious when this date comes closer and when the date arrives, how many millions of people are going to be hoping or willing or actually working in themselves for a consciousness awakening, for a better humankind, for a brotherhood, for a, a clean way to live. And how many are going to be expecting the end of the world and a catastrophe and planet X crashing on the earth and the floods and earthquakes and so on. So I'm sure that the, um, the percentage of people on one side or on the other will affect what will happen, which of course I don't know what could this be. So our task now is to kind of project positively for the future? Well, if, if we are um, willing to live a better life, I think the idea is to be positive towards the future, of course. So what is uh, indigenous voice, you know, the indigenous voice collectively around the world? What does it say about 2012 or about the, the shift that needs to happen? What, what, the, what do they say? I really don't know what most indigenous tribes on the world are thinking about it. For example, in, in the case of, of Mexico, talking with uh, the indigenous people that I know, they are not very much fixed into this date. It seems more like a, a date of the people of the system than indigenous culture. Maybe in the, in the Maya region, is because it's, uh, the date comes from the Maya calendar, uh, closing a huge cycle. But I haven't found this information in other groups. And for example, even uh, the Wichol people, when you try to talk about dates, they are not very much using dates. They don't remember when they were born or how many years they have. Or when you tell them what year is this, they, for them it's a very strange concept. What do you mean what number of a year? They don't get into this. So a, a date like uh, 2012 and a and, uh, closing of this, I, I haven't found it. And I wonder if in other parts of the world what are the ideas of indigenous groups about it? Well, if you take away um, this date, uh, just the idea of a shift, uh, of something happening and us changing our way of life, how do you imagine the world will be after this shift? I have really no idea. I, of course, I hope, like many of us, that it would be a better world. But I have no idea. I see the situation in the planet very complex. And somehow I find it out of control already. Mm. Well, what happens if there is no shift, if this whole 2012 idea, this whole idea of a shift is a lie, what, what happens? <laughs> of course it would happen. Well, things would, would follow the same line that they already have, which is, uh, we already know how things are moving on which direction. Uh, the way that uh, everything is m more controlled and scarcity growing every day and poverty next to it. And, uh, the manipulation through the media and all these things that are already going on for centuries. Mm. Well, how do we begin as individuals then to, to really make this happen? I mean, it's quite, it seems quite urgent to me. If we don't shift, if we don't change something very soon, then we're going to have a really ugly, you know, poisonous world that we're going to be living in. So how do we begin to, to make this happen? How do we make the shift? Well, yes, I think it's very important. In first place, um, we would need to be interested in doing a shift. But I find it 
very important the ship to be made inside of us and not so much at first glance to worry for the outside. How can I love people if I don't love myself, for example? So if I would be really interested in, in loving people or nature, uh, first I have to figure out if I really love myself. And if I find I don't, then to find what are the blockages or the obstacles to be solved in order to understand what love is in first place and then be able to do that on my person. And then, of course, when I know how to love myself, I can very easily love my brothers, sisters, uh, relatives, humanity in general, plants, trees, water, and so on. So for people who feel that they don't love themselves, I mean, how do they do that? I mean, some people talk about mind-altering substances, you know, mushrooms, ayahuasca. You know, what, what maybe is the role of psychedelic plants in, in all of this? Well, I find this these uh, amazing uh, gifts from nature very important since they really uh, and very rapidly if you are prepared they show you different uh, points of view different angles different possibilities of your own being of your person and uh, they certainly give you very important hints on how to begin dealing with your inner task and your inner quest to be a better person um, I don't find it by an accident that uh, all these power plants uh, plug inside the chemistry of our bodies and our brains in such a perfect way and producing these uh, states of awareness. I mean, it could be like eating carrots or they could even be poisonous, but instead they produce states of consciousness, which I find this uh, extraordinary and certainly there is a reason for nature to give us these tools to grow. And it's been used by most cultures since ages. And so you recommend people take this journey and, and, and try these psychedelic plants? This is a, a difficult question because I cannot recommend it, but I cannot say don't do it. Um, because it's so intimate, so private, so personal and so powerful I could probably recommend it to somebody and if the experience doesn't come out well, probably the person could be harmed by itself, of course, but then I would be somehow responsible. And of course, I know if things come out well, it, it's been very nice to recommend it. But what I usually say to people is, um, I won't recommend you to do it or not, but if you feel the, the strong pull to explore yourself through the uh, beautiful plants of nature, go ahead. If you feel the call, do it, because there is a reason for it. Well, what about sacred sites? I mean, a lot of people have kind of powerful altering experiences in sacred sites. I mean, what, what do you think that they're for? Do, do they have a purpose, a role for us in this time? Certainly, yes. Uh, for some reason, I, I found many of the, of the places where uh, antique civilizations stayed were special places. And also, what they built on top was with a special way of building it with a special intention, uh, with a special energy, uh, focusing their minds and feelings to very specific uh, things they wanted to achieve. So I feel it's important to have relationship with, with uh, special places, not only uh, places like ar archaeological sites, uh, but also I guess about any place where nature is left alone is a powerful place just to observe the harmony and the way everything works for each one of the other components. I mean, in nature, everyone is working for the rest of the people. It's an amazing uh, altruism to give to the rest what you can. And every, everyone is giving to you what you need. So I think when nature is left alone, any place of the planet, and, and the entire planet by itself is a power place and we're so lucky to be here.